The majority of the resorts, restaurants, and nightclubs that white Americans enjoyed were inaccessible to middle-class black Americans due to racism in the 19th and early 20th centuries. However, there existed a unique location called Idlewild, a black Eden, in the Northwest Michigan woods. Black intellectuals, writers, doctors, and business people discovered a haven here where they could relax and let go of the heavy burden of racism and segregation. Idlewild gained fame as a gathering spot for black intellectuals and became well known across the country as a venue for seeing and mingling with some of the greatest black performers in history. Welcome to yet another exciting video about black history. Here it highlights the historical existence of black people and their contribution to Western civilization. In today's episode, we'll give you comprehensive information about Idlewild, a vacation destination built to give black Americans a haven during the racial segregation era. For the first time in American history, black people felt proud of being black in this place because they could live the relaxed lifestyle they wanted and their skin tone was never a barrier to it. As I walk you through this historic documentary, stay with me till the very end. Although they did not want to and were often not compensated, black slaves contributed significantly to the establishment of the American economy. African American, those born in the New World, slaves labored mostly on the southern seaboard's tobacco, rice, and indigo plantations during the 17th and 18th centuries. Slavery eventually established itself on the vast cotton and sugar estates of the South. Slavery was never common in the North, even though Northern industrialists made enormous profits from the trafficking of enslaved peoples and investments in Southern plantations. Slave laws, also referred to as slave codes, governed the slave system to encourage total subservience to the master and total control over the slave. Black slaves were considered chattel under these rules, like any other property or labor source that might be purchased and sold like an animal. Black slaves were not permitted to have secure homes or much solitude. It was against the law for black slaves to learn to read or write. The owner bestowed symbols of favor on the humble black slave, while the rebellious black slave incited cruel punishment. Another factor that kept the plantation black slaves apart was the social hierarchy. The majority of field workers, who took the brunt of the hard plantation life, were at the bottom of the social hierarchy, followed by the skilled artisans and the house slaves. Black slaves exhibited various types of individual resistance, including but not limited to poisoning slave masters, destroying crops and machinery, arsoning, pretending to be ill, and fleeing. Abolitionists, both black and white, established a network of covert passageways and hiding places that became known as the Underground Railroad, which helped thousands of escaped slaves find freedom in the North and Canada. Harriet Tubman, a former black slave who assisted hundreds of other slaves in escaping to freedom on multiple voyages to the South, is regarded as one of the greatest heroines of the Underground Railroad. Roughly 10% of African Americans were free black people during the era of enslavement. Nearly 500,000 free African Americans lived in 1860, with half of them in the North and half in the South. The offspring of former indentured servants made up the first segment of the free black community. Free black immigrants from the West Indies and black people set free by individual slave owners added to it. However, black people were only free in theory. They were subject to many of the legal and customary constraints placed on slaves in the South, where they constituted a danger to the system of slavery. Although they could organize and had some access to education, free blacks in the North faced discrimination in their ability to vote, own property, and travel freely. Free black people ran the risk of being abducted and sold into slavery. In the early 1900s, American culture solidified the practice of taking vacations. Recreational travel has grown in popularity among people of various racial backgrounds, genders, and social strata. Traveling was drastically altered by the building of the national highway system, the mass production of automobiles, and the growth of the U.S. rail network. The number of Americans with vacation time and a desire to use their newly acquired freedom and independence increased as a result of technological advancements that made it easier for travelers to travel throughout the lower 48 states. During this period, the idea of the new integral that existed in black America gave rise to distinct black institutions. 
African Americans contributed several tactics to the post-Reconstruction black community's fight against racism and discrimination. Black-owned newspaper houses, such as the Chicago Defender, report on current events while also fostering racial unity. Through this concept, an increasing number of black resorts catering to black tourists became a major battleground for promoting racial upliftment and physical rejuvenation. Black resorts and other distinct black institutions serve as perfect geographic places for promoting racial solidarity. During this period in 1912, Idlewild was established to fulfill a yearning for a tranquil, secure holiday. At the time, it was the third resort in America to serve African Americans. During this time, professionals and small business owners from northern centers made up the majority of the small but very distinctive African American middle class. Black families had very few safe recreational options and were unable to attend resort sites due to segregation, even though there existed a market for black tourism and the financial means for leisure travel. Nestled in the heart of a national forest, 30 miles east of the larger resort town of Ludington, lay the small settlement of Idlewild. Idlewild is an incorporated village in southeast Lake County, a rural area in northwest lower Michigan, in Yates Township. It is situated immediately east of Baldwin. It was one of the few resorts in the nation where African Americans could go on vacation and buy real estate in the first half of the 20th century before discrimination was prohibited in 1964 by the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The Manistee National Forest encompasses the surrounding area. Lake Idlewild is included in the community and the Pear Marquette River headwaters are spread out over the area. The resort was far enough away by car from major cities like Chicago, St. Louis, or Detroit, but it was also sufficiently hidden that African Americans could avoid the ugly discrimination of Jim Crow laws. From 1912 until the middle of the 1960s, Idlewild, dubbed the Black Eden of Michigan, was a thriving year-round town that attracted well-known professionals and performers from all over the nation. Up to 25,000 people would visit Idlewild during the height of the summer to enjoy camping, swimming, boating, fishing, hunting, horseback riding, roller skating, and nighttime entertainment. At its height, it was one of the most well-liked resorts in the Midwest. It was a resort unlike anything else in the country. Black people could visit there without worrying that they wouldn't be served or that they wouldn't be able to use the hotel, motel, or facilities. A group of white developers recognized an opportunity to profit from the expanding black middle class and their discretionary income, so they established Idlewild. Establishment and Development of Idlewild A small but distinct African-American middle class had emerged at this time in several American cities, including several in the Midwest. This class was primarily made up of professionals and small company owners. Even though they were financially able to go for leisure, Racial segregation kept them from engaging in recreational activities in the majority of the region's resort areas. The Idlewild Resort Company, IRC, was founded by four white land developers and their spouses after they saw an opportunity. Wilbur M. Branch, Erastus and Flora Branch, Adelbert and Isabel Branch of nearby White Cloud, Michigan, and A.E. and Mamie Lemon, and Chicago's Mandolin Wright established IRC before World War I. Erastus Branch established a cottage, homesteaded the land for three years, and ultimately acquired the land title through his branch, Anderson and Tyrrell Real Estate Company, which turned into the hub of the resort town to secure land rights. The community's name is said to allude to idle men and wild women in a folk tale. Present-day inhabitants support this retelling of the tale by offering light-hearted t-shirts bearing this saying during the yearly summer festivals in Idlewilders. As soon as the IRC acquired this site, it hired black professionals like Charles Anderson, who effectively promoted the resort by word of mouth and hired African-American middle-class salespeople to market the lot. Critical to the development of black institutions such as Idlewild was also the black press. Black publications such as the Pittsburgh Courier, the Indianapolis Recorder, and the Chicago Defender ran advertisements for the IRC. These advertisements in these well-known news publications offer lots for just $1 a month and $6 down. Citing options for hunting, fishing, boating, and horseback riding, the advertisement was quite successful because it capitalized on the black community's tendency 
to spend small sums of money over an extended period. African Americans would, for instance, join burial organizations where they were required to contribute a few pence each week toward their eventual funeral costs. By giving them tours of the rural community and marketing lots, IRC arranged trips to draw middle-class African-American professionals from Detroit, Chicago, and other Midwestern cities. Their advertisements in national news outlets touted the attractions for boating, fishing, hunting, and horseback riding, and they offered lots at $1 down and $1 a month. The village of beautiful Idlewild is referred to as the Hunter's Paradise and is highlighted in a 1919 leaflet used by IRC to promote the area. It is known for its beautiful lakes of pure spring water and its myriads of game fish. In addition, supporters of the neighborhood highlighted how black people could walk freely without ostracism and hatred in a place where they would feel like American citizens and that there was no prejudice. A 1919 booklet titled Beautiful Eye Wow that the IRC used to advertise the neighborhood. It is billed as a hunter's paradise with stunning lakes, pure spring water, and an abundance of game and fish. Supporters in the region emphasize the absence of discrimination and the ability of black people to travel around without fear of rejection or hostility. It's said that they may feel like residents of the United States in this place. A well-known individual who moved to Idlewild was Dr. Daniel Hale Williams. Williams was a trailblazing surgeon most remembered for having completed one of the first open heart surgeries in history in 1893. Williams' parents, Sarah Price Williams and Daniel Hale Williams II welcomed him into the world on January 18, 1856, in Hollidaysburg, Pennsylvania. Williams lived with family friends in Baltimore, Maryland, then with family in Illinois when his father passed away. From 1866 until 1878, he worked as a barber and apprentice shoemaker until he decided to further his studies. Williams first became interested in medicine in 1878 while working at Wisconsin surgeon Henry Palmer's clinic. He began attending the Chicago Medical College in 1880, graduating three years later with a Doctor of Medicine degree. Williams started his practice in Chicago as soon as he graduated and also taught anatomy at Chicago Medical College. He became a pathfinder, establishing exacting standards for medical practices and hygienic settings. He even adopted recently found sterilizing techniques that addressed the prevention and spread of germs. By founding his hospital, he also escaped the then common practice of black doctors being denied staff privileges in white institutions. In a three-story structure located on Chicago's South Side, Williams co-founded the Provident Hospital and Training School Association in 1891. Provident was the first black-controlled hospital in the U.S., established at a period when 7.5 million African Americans were served by just 909 black physicians. However, Provident was also the nation's first hospital with an all-black staff and the first African-American nursing school. Williams operated Provident Hospital as a physician owner from 1891 to 1912. The hospital's remarkable 87% patient recovery rate was a major factor in its growth. In 1893, Williams bravely operated on a young black man named James Cornish, who had sustained terrible chest knife wounds. Williams opened Cornish's chest cavity and performed heart surgery on him, despite having a limited supply of surgical supplies and medication, and the patient did not pass away from infection. Cornish recovered in 51 days and lived for an additional 50 years. Williams, who is now well known across the country, was named chief surgeon at Freedman's Hospital in Washington, D.C. in 1894. Williams set high standards for medical professionals from around the globe, who came to see his operations as chief surgeon. Along with reorganizing the long-neglected Freedman's Hospital, he also established a black nurse training program, hired a multiracial workforce, enhanced surgical techniques, expanded ambulance services, and gave numerous black physicians employment chances. Williams co-founded the National Medical Association, NMA, in 1895, despite acknowledging the importance of racial integration in the medical industry, after he was refused entrance to the all-white American Medical Association by black medical practitioners. Following his marriage to Alice Johnson in 1898, Williams departed the Freedman's Hospital and relocated to Chicago, where he rejoined Provident Hospital. 
Among the many accolades and distinctions Williams received, his admission as the first African-American to the prestigious American College of Surgeons in 1913 was arguably the most significant. Afterward, he became a member of the first Greek Letter Society for African-Americans, Sigma Pi Phi. Williams joined Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee, a year after moving to Chicago. He worked as a visiting clinical surgeon for the following 20 years. Additionally, he was asked to work in larger medical facilities such as Cook County Hospital and, from 1907 until 1926, St. Luke's Hospital on the south side of Chicago. Williams left St. Luke's in 1926 after overcoming a crippling stroke. This outstanding individual spent his retirement years in Idlewild and was a driving force behind the development of the community. Theodore Williams, Jr. Layla G. Wilson from Chicago, three associates of Williams from Cleveland and Chicago, together with 20 other professionals, were part of the initial group of African-American professionals to participate in IRC's field trip. Later, train trips were offered from several locations, including Chicago, Indiana, Detroit, Grand Rapids, and St. Louis. Over 2,700 acres, 11 kilometers of land were acquired by IRC. The island in Idlewild Lake was given to Chicagoans Williams and Louis B. Anderson, as well as Clevelanders Robert Riff and William Green, when the firm sold off a sizable portion of the land. These individuals worked together to establish the Idlewild Improvement Association, IIA, and assisted in the construction of the clubhouse. The land was sold by IIA to prominent individuals like W.E.B. Du Bois, who co-founded the NAACP, Madam C.J. Walker, a cosmetic entrepreneur, Lemuel L. Foster, President of Fisk University, Albert B. Klieg Sr. of Detroit, Fanny Emanuel of Chicago, and novelist Charles W. Chestnut. Additional middle-class professionals were also brought in by IIA, including William Pickens, the field secretary for the NAACP, H. Franklin and Virginia Bray, a missionary and his spouse who established the first organized church in Idlewild, and the Reverend Robert L. Bradby, senior of the Second Baptist Church of Detroit, who helped to form the Idlewild Lot Owners Association to promote racial pride, economic progress, civility, and respect for Idlewild. IIA encouraged this new wave of community leaders. In 1915, Williams made his first Idlewild real estate purchase. William was very much in the public eye and had a major influence on how Idlewild developed. Williams constructed a tiny, opulent cottage with a rose garden and a chicken coop overlooking Idlewild Lake sometime around 1920. The bungalow was equipped with electricity. Williams would eventually retire to Idlewild, where he grew to prominence as a landowner and community leader. He was a co-founder of the Idlewild Improvement Association, which bought land from white developers and sold it to well-known black Americans, such as Madam C.J. Walker and W.E.B. Du Bois. In his capacity as IIA president, he constructed the modest hotel Oakmere next to a little park. Later, he built a summer pavilion close to the park so that he and visitors might sit and enjoy the dusk. The rise of new black celebrities had a significant influence on Idlewild's development, even if it was not directly related to the Harlem Renaissance. A further factor contributing to Idlewild's early success in the 1920s was the allure of racial pride. The Harlem Renaissance, Garveyism, and the New Negro Movement all showed how popular racial pride was at the time. When W.E.B. Du Bois was editor of The Crisis, these individuals inspired him to ask his readers to write about their positive experiences traveling to these newly established summer resorts for people of color. An essay by H.H. was published by Du Bois. DeWitt during the crisis, when he observed Idlewild, like two playful children, my wife and I roamed the cultivated fields, rambled through the woods, drank turpentine water that collected in boxes on pine trees, and picked blackberries. Du Bois was inspired to visit Idlewild himself in 1921 by this essay. His piece about Idlewild's problems was published. In addition to outlining the resort's origins and growth, Du Bois aimed to elevate Idlewild's profile across the country. Even so, Du Bois was at first suspicious of the intentions of the white individuals in charge of the IRC. He was so taken aback by Idlewild that, throughout his visit, 
he started to perceive the cultural center as more than just a hidden gem. Although he never developed the lots, Du Bois's observations about Idlewild as a living historical space inspired him to buy several lots. Du Bois also encouraged African Americans to invest in Idlewild and offered his blessing. This gracious compliment and free advertisement from such a notable figure helped increase interest from African American professionals, who were also Crisis Magazine subscribers in 1923. In the 1920s and 1930s, Baptist minister Reverend Robert L. Bradby founded the yearly Idlewild Chautauqua. These week-long events drew participants from around the nation, infused the community's recreational life with an intellectual flavor, and received a commendation from Republican Governor of Michigan Fred W. Green, Idlewild Height of Fame. Many African Americans looked for a safe refuge after Jim Crow laws enforced segregation, and segregation made it nearly difficult for them to prosper in American society. State and local statutes known as Jim Crow laws made racial segregation lawful. The laws, which were named after a figure from a black minstrel play, were intended to isolate African Americans by preventing them from voting, keeping jobs, receiving an education, and having access to other possibilities. They were in place for approximately a century, from the post-Civil War era until 1968. Jim Crow laws frequently threatened arrest, fines, jail terms, assault, and even murder for those who dared to disobey them. Jim Crow laws made it difficult or impossible for African Americans to vote, hold public office, serve on juries, or engage in local politics or the economy on an equal footing. Many black people moved to cities in the North and West to avoid the brutality and segregation in the South. This immigration spurred the Harlem Renaissance in New York. The civil rights movement began as a way to oppose racial segregation and acts of violence. It also aided in the passing of laws that ended the Jim Crow era. African Americans experienced prejudice in the workplace, in society, and the law. They were either refused admission altogether or placed in subpar accommodations by theaters, hotels, and restaurants. A travel guide book called The Negro Motorist Green Book was first released in 1937. It included a list of places where African American tourists might anticipate receiving impartial service. Due to segregated public schools, generations of African American children frequently got educations that were inferior to those received by white students, including obsolete or worn out textbooks, underpaid teachers, and subpar facilities and supplies. In Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, the Supreme Court ruled in 1954 that discrimination in education was illegal. However, it would take Congress an additional 10 years to grant minorities full civil rights, including the ability to vote. Idlewild was a refuge for many during the height of Jim Crow laws and segregation enforcement. Idlewild developed into a location where one might be hidden in the nearby woods of the newly established African American community while still being only a few miles from well-known cities like Chicago. With the arrival of this new black intelligentsia in the neighborhood, some became activists and members of Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association, UNIA. Some became adherents of Du Bois' National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP. Some became supporters of the political machine of the late Booker T. Washington, and still others moved as possible investors. The concept of property ownership communicated black social standing and community membership to the bulk of these professionals who brought their families, enforcing segregation, and preventing African Americans from achieving success outside of the Idlewild community. These and more are some of the reasons why Idlewild was eventually referred to as the Black Eden of Michigan. In the interwar years, Idlewild became a national icon among African Americans. The Idlewild Land Owners Association, for instance, had members from more than 34 states in the Union. Apart from offering summertime entertainment to tourists, the Purple Palace, the Flamingo, the Paradise Club, the Idlewild Club, Rosanna Tavern, and Pearl's Bar also gave seasonal and year-round residents of the neighborhood jobs. By 1923, a post office was opened, the Pear Marquette Railroad had constructed a branch line to the area, and the Idlewild Fire Department had been founded not long after. As a result of the influx of these noteworthy businesses, the city saw the entrance of numerous new business owners. 
Idlewild started to resemble the look of a well-known American civilization as a result of the development of new businesses and population. Over 6,000 persons had bought over 17,000 properties in the area by the middle of the 1920s. From June to September, the Père Marquette Railway operated the Resort Special, a sleeper car service that stopped five miles west of Baldwin and ran it from Chicago and Detroit via Grand Rapids. From the station in Idlewild, the Père Marquette Railway ran trains westward to Baldwin and subsequently Ludington, trains eastward to Saginaw. The trains were scheduled to meet separate trains that originated in Bay City and headed to Detroit at Saginaw. In the later months of 1949, the Ludington to Saginaw trains via Idlewild were discontinued by the PM's successor, the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway. Despite being far from the urban centers where they lived and worked, the railroad helped draw a diverse range of other black middle-class people to Idlewild for entertainment and relaxation. By 1924, the clubhouse and many of the lakefront properties surrounding Idlewild Lake belonged to the IIA, which also held partial control over the island. The IIA represented the local black population as the IRC grew and spread to other subsites. In the same year, the IIA released its pamphlet and said that Idlewild was the playground for black people if Atlantic City was America's playground. Should you have ever been to Michigan's Idlewild Wonderland, you would undoubtedly concur with this assertion. IIA realized that to draw these and several other black professionals to the area, they needed to persuade them that Idlewild was the place to be, where they could come to experience the greatest in entertainment, along with the delights of outdoor recreation. In terms of the commercialization of outdoor leisure and recreation, this component of the IRC's experiment proved to be quite successful. Idlewild was continuously transformed into a leisure area, and the business adopted integration and accommodation as its guiding principles. By bringing together Chautauqua, the IRC concentrated its politics on the opinions of well-known and affluent African-American consumers in 1925. The American adult education and social movement known as the Chautauqua reached its height of fame in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Up until the middle of the 1920s, Chautauqua assemblies grew and dispersed throughout rural America. The Chautauqua featured speakers, educators, musicians, performers, preachers, and experts of the day to provide culture and enjoyment to the entire community. The statement, the most American thing in America, is frequently attributed to President Theodore Roosevelt regarding Chautauqua. Many Chautauqua assemblies still meet today, including the original Chautauqua Institution in Chautauqua, New York. He said, it is a source of positive strength and refreshment of mind and body to come to meet a typical American gathering like this, a gathering that is typically American in that it is typical of America at its best. The number of African-American guests at Idlewild each year rose from a few hundred to five or 6,000 between 1915 and 1927. Due to the expanding black population, particularly in the summer, this historical movement was ready for middle-class and upper-class African-American migrants to take the lead in leaving their mark on the Idlewild society. A significant number of black-owned companies, including a grocery store, dress shop, car wash, bike rental shop, at least five cafes, two hotels, 12 motels, boarding house, four nightclubs, and even a post office can be found in the business district for black resort visitors. Even the Great Depression was unable to stop the growth of Idlewild's year-round population, tourism industry, and new construction. This enabled Idlewild to continue growing during the Great Depression and was primarily due to the notoriety the community had gained through the black press, as well as the support of municipal, state, and federal laws, as well as the initiatives of black communities in the Southwest. The global economic slump known as the Great Depression started in 1929 and continued until around 1939. It was the longest and worst depression that the industrialized West had ever seen, and it led to significant alterations in macroeconomic policy, economic theory, and economic institutions. The Great Depression, though it started in the United States, affected nearly every nation on Earth resulting in sharp drops in output, high rates of unemployment, and severe deflation. Its consequences on society and culture were as profound, particularly in the United States, 
where the Great Depression was the worst hardship Americans had experienced since the Civil War. Different nations experienced the Great Depression at different times and to varying degrees. While the Depression was gentler in Japan and most of Latin America, it was especially long and severe in the United States and Europe. It should come as no surprise that several factors contributed to the world economy experiencing its worst depression ever. The United States experienced a decline in economic output due to a combination of misguided government policies, financial panics, and declining consumer demand. Additionally, the gold standard, which established a network of fixed currency exchange rates among nearly all nations, was a major factor in spreading the effects of the American downturn to other nations. The demise of the gold standard and the subsequent monetary expansion played a major role in the Great Depression's recovery. The Great Depression had a significant economic impact, resulting in both severe human misery and significant shifts in economic strategy. The Great Depression had an impact on almost every nation on Earth. Nonetheless, there were significant national differences in the timing and severity of the recession. Most of the second half of the 1920s saw sluggish growth and recession in Great Britain. It was not until early 1930 that the nation entered a serious depression, and its industrial production declined from its peak to its lowest point at a rate of around one-third that of the United States. A brief recession of its own was also felt in France in the early 1930s. However, the French rebound of 1932 and 1933 was not long-lasting. Between 1933 and 1936, there was a significant decline in both French industrial production and prices. Early in 1928, Germany's economy began to contract. It then stabilized before contracting once more in the third quarter of 1929. German industrial production declined at a rate that was almost equivalent to that of the U.S. Just before the output decrease in the United States, in late 1928 and early 1929, several countries in Latin America experienced a downturn. While some less developed nations, like Brazil and Argentina, saw relatively moderate downturns, others, like those in Argentina, experienced devastating depressions. Remarkably, Idlewild's expansion was unaffected by the Great Depression. The fact that Idlewild was included in the renowned Negro Green Book in 1946, thanks to the efforts of the Idlewild Chamber of Commerce, may have contributed to the town's ongoing growth throughout the Great Depression. During the U.S. South segregation era, the Negro Green Book, a travel guidebook, was published from 1936 to 1967 and listed establishments that catered to African Americans. Before the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed, black postman Victor Hugo Green, 1892-1960, of the Harlem neighborhood of New York City, compiled the Green Book, which included a list of establishments that were essential for black Americans to travel safely and comfortably. These included hotels, restaurants, beauty parlors, and drugstores. Midway through the 20th century, the number of Americans who could purchase vehicles had spare income and leisure time including paid vacations, that allowed them to see the nation skyrocket, leading to an explosion in automobile travel. For most Americans, driving was a happy, spontaneous adventure because of the convenience provided by the abundance of vacation rentals, wayside hotels, eateries, and tourist attractions. However, during the Jim Crow era, this was rarely the case for African American travelers. Black travelers had to always be on the lookout for the possibility of racial violence, such as lynching, in addition to the inconvenience and humiliation of being turned away from establishments due to the widespread practice of segregation, which was not limited to the South but the entire nation. There were numerous sundown towns dotting the countryside, where it was forbidden for persons of color to be present after dusk. African-American motorists packed blankets and pillows, extra food, beverages, gasoline, and portable toilets, to deal with the uncertainty of finding housing, meals, and fuel. Green realized how difficult, embarrassing, and frightening driving was for black people when he married a woman from Richmond, Virginia, to which they had to travel from their Harlem residence. He made an effort to solve the issue in 1936 by creating the Negro Motorist Green Book, a 15-page directory of travel-related companies in metropolitan New York City that catered to African-American clients. Green, who was 44 at the time, 
used referrals from other postal workers in addition to his first-hand knowledge to put together the listing. Green found a model for his magazine in the trip guides for Jews that were published in Jewish publications. Green lived in Harlem but worked as a mail carrier in New Jersey. Due to the overwhelming popularity of the first Green book, Green decided to broaden his ambition to include the entire country by the time the second yearly edition was released in 1937. To accomplish this, he reached out to postal workers throughout the nation, using his affiliation with the National Association of Letter Carriers to obtain information. Charles McDowell, the coordinator on Negro Affairs for the United States Travel Bureau, a department of the Interior Institution tasked with promoting tourism in the country, also supported him. Early on, Green also started asking users of the guide for recommendations. The book included listings for pubs, nightclubs, tailor shops, barber shops, beauty salons, drug stores, liquor stores, gas stations, and garages in addition to hotels, vacation rentals, and restaurants. The guide had travel advice, what to wear, in Bermuda, customer reviews of cars, articles on safe driving, attractions, what to see in Chicago, travel essays, a Canadian trip, and special themes, how to guard your home during vacation season. Thus, Idlewild's incredible growth was spurred when it was included in this well-recognized publication as a safe and essential tourism destination for African Americans. Diverse talents arrived in Idlewild, where they made a significant contribution to the establishment of the resort community there. Other noteworthy creative, musical, and intellectual abilities were fostered at Idlewild, bringing the black communities of New York and Chicago closer together, following the principles of the Renaissance movement and the New Negro. Between World Wars I and II, Idlewild became a national symbol for African Americans. The Idlewild Landowners Association had members in nearly 34 states, in addition to taverns and clubs. In addition to offering jobs for both seasonal and year-round locals, the resort served as a summer attraction for tourists. After World War II, Idlewild gained prominence among African Americans in the working middle class due to the development of more paved roads and increased access to electricity. Idlewild attracted investments from a fresh generation of business people. African American entrepreneurs capitalized on the market by acquiring real estate in Idlewild and transforming these neighborhoods into opulent hangouts and commercial hubs. Idlewild drew what some sociologists have referred to as the new African American working middle class after World War II. A new generation of business people started to invest in Idlewild as a result of the development of a few paved roads, renovations made to the township's sole post office, and increased access to electricity. Arthur Big Daddy, Braggs, Phil Giles, William N., Sonny, Wilson, and numerous other African-American entrepreneurs capitalized on the market by acquiring land in Paradise Gardens and Williams Island and transforming them into opulent entertainment and commercial hubs. Sonny Wilson and other well-known Detroiters who vacationed at Idlewild established the Detroit Idlewilders Club in 1952. The group's original goals were to support social entertainment and relaxation in Idlewild, as well as charity and civic efforts. During that time, a lot of African-American performers appeared in Idlewild, especially at the Arthur Bragg's run Paradise Club. The list of performers included Della Reese, Al Hibbler, Bill Doggett, Jackie Wilson, T-Bone Walker, George Kirby, The Four Tops, Roy Hamilton, Brooke Benton, Choker Campbell, Lottie the Body, Graves, The Rhythm Kings, Sarah Vaughn, Cab Calloway, Louis Armstrong, Dinah Washington, B.B. King, Aretha Franklin, Fats Waller, and Billy Eckstein, Laverne Baker and Detroit's Queen of the Blues, Alberta Adams, performed at the Flamingo Club, which was managed by Phil Giles. Throughout the 1950s and early 1960s, numerous additional acts delighted white residents of nearby Lake County townships, as well as idle wilders. Beginning in the summer of 1950, Arthur Braggs promoted singers, dancers, showgirls, and other performers who appeared in the Fiesta Room at the Paradise Club from May through September, assisting Idla Wild in being known as the Summer Apollo of Michigan. One home owner recalled that not all club goers were black. On certain evenings, there were more white people in there than blacks. It wasn't about race, it was about fun. 
In addition to performing at Idlewild, the Paradise Club Showgirls and Chorus Girls also toured the country as part of the Arthur Bragg's Idlewild Review during the off-season. Cities including Montreal, Toronto, Boston, Kansas City, Chicago, and New York hosted the group's appearances. In Manhattan, the Apollo Theater hosted the event. Idlewild's growth as a significant entertainment hub and the local economy were both aided by Bragg's show. The Negro Motorist Green Book featured advertisements for a few of Idlewood's features. Both well-known and lesser-known performers' abilities were shown at Idlewild, and many of these lesser-known performers went on to achieve national and worldwide recognition. The Flamingo Room and the Paradise Club, two of Idlewild's largest venues, provided two shows every night at different times so that patriots could visit both clubs. Idlewild parties and after-parties turned into legendary events. Both white residents who traveled from the Lake County Township and black Idlewild residents were thrilled by the shows. In the 1950s and early 1960s, Idlewild experienced its peak of popularity, drawing about 25,000 tourists during that time, overpowering the area's long-term inhabitants for a short while. Idlewild helped over 300 black-owned businesses grow during this time. Idlewild's decline and attempt at reconstruction. Idlewild's business suffered once the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed. A comprehensive piece of American legislation, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, sought to outlaw discrimination based on race, color, religion, or national origin. It is a cornerstone of the American civil rights movement and is frequently referred to as the most significant civil rights law passed in the country since Reconstruction, 1865-77. Equal voting rights are ensured by Title I of the Act, which does away with discriminatory registration rules and practices that disadvantage minorities and the poor. Title II forbids discrimination or segregation in establishments that serve the public and are involved in interstate commerce. Employers, trade unions, and educational institutions that engage in interstate commerce or do business with the federal government are prohibited from discriminating by Title VII. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, was created under the latter section to enforce these laws, which also apply to discrimination based on sex. 2020 saw the U.S. according to the Supreme Court's decision in Bostock v. Clayton County, Georgia, dismissing an employee for being homosexual, lesbian, or transgender violates Title VII's ban on sex discrimination. In addition, the Act guarantees non-discrimination in the allocation of funding under federally funded programs, Title VI, calls for the desegregation of public schools, Title IVER, and expands the responsibilities of the Civil Rights Commission. Title V. When President Kennedy first introduced the Civil Rights Act, it was a contentious topic in the U.S. Kennedy failed to get the bill passed in Congress, but at the insistence of his successor, President Dr. On July 2, 1964, Lyndon B. Johnson signed the bill into law, capping one of the longest Senate debates ever. In response to the legislation, white organizations opposed to integration with African Americans staged large scale rallies boosted support for pro-segregation candidates running for public office, and even some acts of racial violence. In the test case Heart of Atlanta Motel v. U.S. 1964, the Supreme Court maintained the act's constitutionality in the face of instant challenges to its validity. The act empowered federal law enforcement organizations to stop racial discrimination in public accommodations, employment, and voting. Businesses in Idlewild suffered after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and more especially the Public Accommodations Act of 1964, were passed. Other resorts started to welcome African American guests, as mandated by federal law that they be welcomed everywhere. When African Americans started to seize this chance, the idea of an independent black community was unable to triumph against the allure of thousands of shops, lodging facilities, and dining establishments where they had previously been forbidden. For example, a lot of people visited the casinos in Las Vegas and the beaches in Florida, which reduced the number of people who could visit Idlewild. Idlewild was founded on segregation, and the Civil Rights Act of 1964 ultimately proved to be the community's downfall. National Public Radio reported that it was integration that killed Idlewild. Blacks no longer had to remain invisible, they wanted to take a tour to the location of their dream 
where they were once prohibited. The Chesapeake and Ohio Railway, which had truncated its line from its Petoskey terminus to Grand Rapids Traverse City, ended service on this route in 1966, and Idlewild lost its last nearby train access in Baldwin. In Grand Rapids, passengers were transferred to trains destined for Chicago. The economic downturn in Idlewild was exacerbated by the National Recession in the early 1970s, and as local employment opportunities decreased, the town's population began to fall. Retirees who recalled Idlewild from its heyday era were the community's main draw, and it eventually became a lesser-known family vacation and retirement destination. Township officials launched a zoning board, planning commission, and other programs in the 1970s to solicit community feedback and provide targeted, workable ideas to enhance the neighborhood. After obtaining Community Development Block Grants, CDBG, for structural modifications, extra road construction, and demolition, the island underwent a dramatic transformation and was renamed Williams Island in honor of Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, a prominent local figure in the early years. Due to a lack of federal and state financing in the 1990s, renovations of existing township properties took precedence over new construction projects. When Lake County was named an enterprising community by the federal government, it made it easier to build natural gas and sewer infrastructure. Entrepreneur John O. Meeks established the Idlewild African American Chamber of Commerce and Mid-Michigan Idlewilders, two groups aimed at fostering community development and advancement in addition to buying and refurbishing the Morton Motel. Still, a trustworthy source claimed that by 1998, the economy was in a dismal state and that many citizens were receiving welfare. By then, the Flamingo had closed and the Paradise Club had been demolished. Even though Idlewild gave black African Americans a sense of security, leisure, and community during this prosperous time, it was only possible because of discriminatory state and local laws it was also because of the caste system that had been established in America that a small number of white men were able to buy a sizable chunk of land in Michigan. They created it and aggressively promoted it as the greatest destination for African Americans in the United States. And the same organization had no qualms at all about building a second resort for white people. Everyone knew that even the black chauffeurs and maids were welcome and allowed to enjoy themselves. Racial discrimination and segregation had two opposing effects. They aided in the formation of the American caste system, which maintained social order between whites and blacks. The caste system rendered the existence of the black community's social institutions imperative. The civil rights movement had its start in the 1950s and persisted in opposing laws that maintained the caste system, particularly those that denied African Americans equal rights and segregation. Many politicians and civil rights activists declared social integration to be the real American dream. The civil rights movement centered most of its efforts on integrating these groups into a cohesive social mass. Legislation ending segregation was enthusiastically welcomed by many African Americans, who also took advantage of the opportunity to confront white establishments and oppose the legislation. A new generation of young black people started to learn about the background and significance of Idlewild in the late 1960s. When these newly arrived black people realized that Idlewild had not been ready for the issue of integration, black nationalism took hold among them and they did not want to see the resort close. The Idlewild Landowners Association hosted yearly conventions to discuss the potential for the resort to experience a revival. However, it appeared that the wealthy individuals who could afford to invest in the establishment, which may draw black tourists for years to come, were not particularly enthusiastic about the idea. The tourism development strategy for Idlewild, Michigan, was a 10-year strategic plan that was funded by the state of Michigan and finished in 2013. In 2019, the Idlewild Historic and Cultural Center will be open on Saturdays. It provides a self-guided driving tour of the town stopping at sites such as the Paradise Club, the Flamingo Club, and some of the former residences of well-known people. The National Idlewilders Club still plans yearly gatherings. Currently the sole store in town, Roadrunners is a typical one-stop shop for rural communities. They sell whiskey, cigarettes, beer, pop, coffee, tea, and cans of soup. They also sell bags of chips. 
The Idlewild Historic and Cultural Center features pictures and artifacts from the town's heyday. In 2017, Idlewild supporter John O. Meeks gave the following description of the community in an interview with the New York Post. We have three motels here now. There used to be 35. We have one restaurant. There used to be 25. I don't expect it to be what it once was, but I do believe it deserves a future. Journalist Selena Zito stated that, Idlewild is not a complete ghost town. Its pristine lakes remain home to a couple of hundred people, mostly those left over from its heyday, and a few newcomers such as Township Supervisor Carrington Atkins, who recently bought the perfectly preserved home of famed black author Charles Waddell Chestnut. And yet, many of its houses are empty, its storefronts fallen victim to nature. Idlewild was declared a ghost town by East Lansing radio station WFMK in February 2019 because of the abandoned neighborhoods, block after block of abandoned homes and yards. Many entire blocks are abandoned and vacant aside from the crumbling shacks that were once homes, a claim that was backed up by several images. However, several activities were scheduled for 2019. For example, the fifth annual Idlewild Education Empowerment and Music Festival Weekend, July 13-14, was scheduled, featuring Carly and Gill, an original Bragg's Fiesta doll dancer. Despite this decline, Idlewild symbolized the heyday of the combination of race, leisure, and geography to create a briefly prosperous community through niche tourism, read a 2011 Black Pass piece summarizing the town's legacy. Fewer than 1,000 people were living there in 2019, not quite a ghost town, as described in Chapter 7 of the book Ghost Towns of Michigan, and many of the structures were abandoned. Established by John O. Meeks in 2000, the Idlewild African American Chamber of Commerce is still in the process of promoting current local businesses and looking to acquire new ones. To revitalize the formerly bustling town, it is also making an effort to draw more tourists to the region through events and other tactics. In conclusion, African Americans founded a variety of resorts over the decades while segregation existed in the U.S. Black resorts were standalone business buildings, rentable rooms, excellent dining and meals, cocktail bars, dancing, sports facilities, golf, tennis, horseback riding, swimming pools, fishing, and badminton, and beaches were among the many resort accommodations. In some instances, Entire towns or townships were recognized as African-American vacation spots. African-American tourists had to deal with things like white-owned establishments turning them away or refusing to fix their cars, motels owned by white people turning them away or not giving them food or lodging, and threats of physical harm and forced removal from sundown towns for white people alone. The creation of Idlewild gave African-Americans a place to call home, African Americans undoubtedly never thought that there would be a place in America where being black would not have any consequences. Everyone, black and white alike, was treated with the highest respect and regard, and no one was condemned based on the color of their skin. The Negro Motorist Green Book, which Green founded and published, assisted African Americans in avoiding racial segregation issues. The information in the Green Collection of Resources served to provide the black traveler with knowledge that would prevent problems and embarrassment and enhance his enjoyment of the trip. This Green Book made a significant contribution to Idlewild's amazing development and progress. However, throughout history, including periods of enslavement, Jim Crow legislation, segregation, and the civil rights movement, African Americans have experienced systematic and violent racism. African Americans have been kept out of numerous facets of American life due to racism, and these experiences have had a significant impact on African American culture. Furthermore, African Americans have shown extraordinary ingenuity in creating unique traditions, radical innovations, and cultural expressions that frequently act as potent tools for advancing racial justice and influencing African American culture despite these significant obstacles and other experiences of racial discrimination. Idlewild, Michigan, has endured the test of time as a haven for African Americans in a time when they sought to have a place where their skin color wouldn't be a limiting barrier. The community's identity remains unchanged, although its appeal has waned over time. Nonetheless, an endeavor is underway to revive Idlewild's past and make the town's legends a reality today.
the people spearheading that endeavor stated that Hotel Casablanca, Idlewild's most iconic structure, needs to be restored first for change to occur. We would love to hear what tale about Idlewild you heard. Also, do you believe that African Americans of today ought to take notice and see to it that an Idlewild-like tourist destination, or perhaps Idlewild itself, is created? Kindly give your contribution or response in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and want more videos on black people's history and their contribution to Western civilization, kindly hit the like and subscribe button. Don't forget to turn on the notification bell so that you can be informed when we upload new videos. I appreciate your time, and I'll see you in a future video.